agree with Faye. Like the cynical former politician in me thinks that the National Cabinet is a way of diluting responsibility because there haven't been too many successes to be bragging about when it comes to our national rollout. Grace, you're a, um, an observer all of this from Tasmania, a fortunate place, place to be in many aspects. How, how do you see it? Would any of this impact your decision on, on having a vaccine? Um, look, I mean, I, I like to take a utilitarian view on this sort of thing. I think that um, as many people need to be vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, and so we need to use the resources um, that we have uh, where they can be used. Um, so the vaccines that we do already have, you know, we can we can use them with um, people over 50. Um, but uh, as far as my own um, situation, um, yes, I am pretty fortunate that, that I'm here in Tassie um, and I personally would like to wait until there's a little bit more clarity around the different um, vaccines and their efficacy. Yeah, very, very, very fair point. Faye, a lot of excitement about the Trans-Tasman bubble today, um, opening up opportunities for, you know, mm -hmm. fun in another land. But wh what kind of impact do you think it might have if we're actually not able to go to any other countries within the next year while we're waiting for all this to come through? Wouldn't this have a significant impact on the coalition's, you know, electoral viability? It's clearly a front of mind issue for the federal government. Um, the only person who's talking actively about expanding our international travel opportunities is the Prime Minister. Everybody else is kind of saying, well, let's just wait and see because where are you going to go? And we'll go to a New Zealand, lovely. Pacific, where at certain places, great. Singapore, yeah, maybe. But beyond that, we're just going to have to cool our jets. And I think we may be better off managing people's expectations rather than overblowing them because you're only setting yourself up for failure. I think if a lesson could have been learnt from the last six months of communication is expectation management is a national service mm. rather than taking the political view, which is about trying to give people false confidence. Right, but, but, but the Prime Minister is also doing it to urge kind of other states and industries to, to support, you know, opening up of borders, right? But the impact will be on him and his party if, if it doesn't happen, irrespective of whether or not he's raising those expectations. People want it to happen. It's a confidence game. Yeah. You know, and the problem with a confidence game is you have to be able to deliver credibly behind it. There's one thing to say. It's like saying to your kids, you know, we're going to go to Luna Park. Luna Park's closed. You're not going. Mm. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> yes, we have. I think. I mean, I think Faye's right. This is a confidence game in terms of the messaging. Uh, you know, I was surprised when the Prime Minister announced targets by October. I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a lay communicator, but I would have thought that, that wasn't wise. Um, and again, I think one of the great communicators through this has been has been the New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian, mm. setting expectations. Now, I think a lot of people want to travel overseas. I don't think necessarily it's a bad thing for the government if they don't open the borders, but they've got to set the expectations that, look, we need to get this under control globally. We need to make sure people are vaccinated before we even think about that step. I'm sure he's getting pressure from people to open borders, you know, business and like, but mm. I think really setting the expectations down, I don't think will, will, will kill off the government. Yeah. All right, with vaccine hesitancy continuing to be an issue, governments <coughs> across the world are doing everything possible to sway those that are still on the fence about receiving a COVID jab. Viewers of a certain age will remember Live Aid, a series of benefit concerts held in cities around the world in July 1985. This was done to raise funds about the people of Ethiopia as they endured one of the worst famines in living memory. Now, while the impact of Live Aid has been debated ever since, along with some of the music, it's continued to inspire spin-off events to this day. And soon we'll be able to watch the COVID-19 version. Vax Live is the brainchild of Australian Hugh Evans, the CEO and founder of advocacy group Global Citizen. This has certainly been a very enormous challenge because, you know, our first and foremost priority is to make sure that we comply with all of the relevant both state, county and, uh, and city guidelines as it relates to COVID compliance. And so we're pre-recording the concert here in Los Angeles on May Greatest Artist of Our Generation. People need people. It's going to be headlined by Jennifer Lopez with extraordinary performances by the Foo Fighters, with J Balvin, her, 
Eddie Vedder from, from Pearl Jam, and it's going to be hosted by Selena Gomez. But this is an opportunity to demonstrate what the world can be like if we open up. And so the audience will be made up of fully vaccinated frontline community health workers. For Vax Live, we really want to focus on two main objectives. The first one is to increase vaccine confidence, to overcome the questions that people have that make them hesitant to take the vaccine and ask those questions about safety and efficacy. And so this concert provides an opportunity to do just that, as does the campaign leading into it. But really the second thing is focused on vaccine equity because there are 27 million heroic frontline community health workers, doctors, nurses on the ground all around the world that don't have access to a single shot of the vaccine. Because we know that of the 830 million doses that have been administered so far, the vast majority of them have gone just to 10 countries. What we've been calling on is for every nation to contribute 5% of their vaccine doses to the world's poorest nations, particularly to those heroic healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the teachers on the front line around the world. And currently Australia's contribution represents 2%. So there's still an opportunity for Australia to be better and to, to increase their, their dose donation to up to 5% over the coming months. Labor appears to be hedging its bets on the question of Australia's reliance on coal, saying it will remain a vital export commodity throughout this century, whilst also committing to a target of net zero emissions by 2050. I'm more than prepared to go into regional communities, including coal-based communities, and talk about the future and the challenges of the future and the fact that 70% of our trading partners are moving to net zero emissions. And that'll, that'll really change the way our coal industry works in mm. the future. We need to be honest and clear about that. What we're not prepared to do is say, well, we're going to shut down the Australian uh, coal market and other countries will fulfil that void. You know, uh, the coal-fired power stations in other countries will continue to operate as long as their policies enable them to. And if we cut, shut down our coal exports tomorrow, as the Greens would have us do, all that would happen, there would not be one reduction in emissions. The comments come ahead of a looming state by-election in the coal-rich Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Six Adani-sized coal mines have been proposed for the region, which is also a fertile agricultural plain. Labor has also rejected a call by former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who owns land in the Hunter Valley, for a moratorium on new coal mines. Kate Ellis, what's going on here? We have um, Opposition Resources spokeswoman saying that it's time for a mature conversation, we need to have a mature debate about transition. Does that actually just mean taking it easy and um, making sure we don't upset the Queenslanders? Well, I certainly hope not. Um, I should just stress that I am not a Labor spokesperson here tonight yep. and um, I have not been party to the discussions or policy development. Um, but what I do know is that, you know, I've seen firsthand in my 15 years in Parliament, there was no issue um, that was more brutally fought in a divisive destructive and a really distracting way than that of climate change. Mm. And so I think um, what is really important is that the community and indeed our political parties need to stay focused on what do we need to do um, to fix this um, catastrophe. And in my mind, there's two answers. One, we need to commit to net zero by 2050. But secondly, we actually need international leadership. We need to be back on the global stage advocating and making sure that we're doing all we can to make sure that other developing countries are also reducing their reliance on coal. And sadly, Australia is not doing either of these things at the moment, but they are the two things that matter. They're the two things that will actually save the planet. But back to the ALP policy, I mean, is coal really the middle ground? Well, I'm not sure. Um, whether I think that was a headline. I'm not sure that that came from the Labor Party calling it a middle ground. Um, I think what they are saying and what Chris Bowen was just saying is that we need to have really honest conversations about the transition 
and about the fact that there will be impacts on jobs as people reduce their reliance on coal. Um, but we also need to work with those workers and have a focus on um, protecting and helping transition jobs. So, you know, it's not an easy answer, but I, I don't think the middle ground talk is helpful. I think that we all need to get on the one page on net zero and actually an international effort. At the moment, Australia is still being shunned from international negotiations, which is deeply embarrassing and unhelpful. Hmm. Faye, how do you see it? I mean, it, it is obviously a crude polarity to talk about you know, coal in one corner and climate in the other corner when you're transitioning. Mm. But we are fully aware of what industry's view of coal is and where the market is lying on coal and what the future of coal is. What, what do you make of the, the ALP policy here? I think we have to remember what was in the news which was covered by you know, the Australian and the West Australian, so not necessarily the most unbiased um, sources, the, is that Labor basically made a commitment not to fight coal. It, it was successfully wedged in 2019 at the federal election by the coalition turning a conversation about coal into a convers or energy and mining extraction into a conversation about jobs. And Labor just said, we're not going to die on that hill anymore. We're going to accept the fact that in actual fact, the global markets will make the decision about whether or not we have a viable coal future. But in the interim, we're going to make sure that the people who are employed in that industry actually have a successful employment plan going forward rather than just you know it's very convenient for disruptors to not care about the sectors you're disrupting but in actual fact they're real people and Labor's saying they're real people who need a transition whether you want to turn that into a euphemistic word it's a reality you need to get them from the jobs they've got today to the potential jobs they can have in 10 years time and what, what does it mean kind of for, for leadership when it when it comes to this because chris bowen was on um he was emphatic today that the states will make a decision about the new coal mines Ooh. that the states are moving ahead with their own zero net emissions and industry have their own targets is that just is that choosing kind of not to take the fight on because others will do it exactly you don't have to die on every hill and this is they're just saying quite rationally it is not a mutually exclusive conversation. Coal and climate change are not, dis are not disconnected. So you, but they need to have a strategy that deals with both. And coal equals jobs. Climate change needs to also equal future jobs. And that's what they're saying in the actual policy if you read it. Mm. Now, what, what about the, the coalition position when it comes to climate, Craig? Because, I mean, as, as Kate has mentioned, um, we've been excluded from international dialogue uh, when it comes to, you know, how to deal with the effects of climate. Um, we have the opposition leader in WA saying, you know, coal is, is certainly not the answer. He wasn't electorally successful, but nonetheless garnered a lot of attention for that. We have New South Wales moving ahead with renewables and, and some uncertainty at the, at the federal stage who, who had, you know, at the federal level, who've always had problems in getting unanimous support on any kind of coherent plan. Like Where does that leave national us? cabinet. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, All leadership. Absolutely. Look, look. I, I agree with a lot of the things that Faye has said. Um, you don't need to die on the hill on these issues, but I, I think that you also can't be hypocritical about it either. When you've got Labor on the, on the one hand pressing uh, the federal government on issues of coal mining um, and trying to connect both you know, the, the elimination of coal mining uh, and, and climate change. Uh, look, I'm a person who thinks that we should get to, to, to net zero by 2050. It's, it is not, um, it doesn't mean that we can't continue to save jobs and continue to, to create jobs where coal mining has been. Let's remember that in that, that area where the by-election is in New South Wales, 50% of the jobs in Singleton are in coal mining. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the devastation on families and the economy is enormous. So let's look towards a 30, that 30-year 30 transition of how do we reduce the reliance on coal while recognising that it's going to be there. There's still a worldwide market. It is decreasing. Um, there will be a market-driven outcome to this. Uh, and I think the coalition, honestly, in my view, uh, my friends in the party are saying we need to head towards you know, a, a net zero by 2050. I think that's where we will end up. Um, it's this balancing but act. Do we have the plan for that? I mean, there's, there's the, the transition for coal is one thing, and then the other is actually moving towards renewable energy. But I want to ask um, Grace something, which is... One of the things that, that Madeleine King spoke about was we need to end this, you know, coal versus climate 
thing and we need to end, her actual words were the climate wars. What do you mm. make of that? Well, I think that much like the issue that I, I speak to, and that's um, sexual abuse, this issue is far too important to be politicised. Um, and I agree with a, a lot of what Kate said. Um, you know, we, we need to be having honest conversations about how serious this issue is. All right. To remind you, you're watching The Drum with me on the panel partner at Newgate Communications, Faye Akindoyeni, Liberal City of Sydney Councillor Craig Chung, in Adelaide, former Labor MP Kate Ellis, and in Hobart, Australian of the Year and advocate for survivors of sexual assault, Grace Tame. It's now almost three months since Grace Tame was named Australian of the Year. But in that short period, there has been a seismic shift across the nation. Allegations of sexual misconduct in Parliament, private schools, the Defence Force, all of it has ignited a national debate over equality, consent, respect, sexual assault, the criminal justice system, and triggered difficult conversations and painful recollections. In Hobart, the local sexual assault support service has experienced a significant increase in people coming forward for help, many saying they've been inspired by Grace's advocacy. In Queensland, DB Connect has seen a 42% increase in calls between February and March, and this, there are similar reports from Victoria. The stigma of sexual assault doesn't belong to a victim, it belongs to the perpetrator. And it is so freeing for people to finally feel that it's safe for them to come out and to disclose that they're a victim survivor. Grace, this is really astonishing, kind of witnessing what's going on at the moment and it's, it's unprecedented in this country when it comes to sexual assault and much of it inspired by, by your example of speaking out. What do, you, what do you make of it, of this mass telling of stories? Oh, look, it's incredible. Um, and as distressing as this time is in a lot of ways because, like you've identified, we're sort of having a mass disclosure, um, as distressing as that is, it's so hopeful because this only needs to happen once. Now that people have this social permission to share their truth, we can get all of the information that's born of the lived experience stories and from that information we can move forward um, and you know, develop proper education strategies and legislation accordingly. So that makes me incredibly excited. And I'm seeing the change in real time. Every time I step off a stage after giving a speech, I have people come up to me, not only are they sharing their stories, but they're saying things like, oh, you know, the conversations that I'm having in the workplace have changed because of this movement. Um, the dinner table conversations have changed because of this movement. That's change in real time. And it is overwhelmingly positive. And you've described it also as like a kind of a mass freeing. What do you think women are freeing, women and men who are speaking out about abuse, are freeing themselves from? Shame. And it's in this, um, you know, reconnection that comes from having these open and honest conversations that we can properly heal, not just as individuals, but as a collective and then properly move forward. So it's, yeah, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a freeing, it's a breaking of the shackles, if you will. Is it shame, is it blame as well? Yeah, shame and blame and, and we're, you know, we're finding out more about what goes on, um, you know, the psychological manipulation. I think that's an area that we are starting to see more light shed on um, because in the past, you know, we obviously know that, that sexual assault is an issue, rape is an issue, um, but there's been a lot of focus on the, the physical details. But now through these open, lengthy discussions, these honest discussions, we're hearing more about the psychological manipulation. And in doing that, we're able to properly address the um, unhelpful... Uh, victim blaming rhetoric um, that uh, actually enables predatory behaviour. And how are you, how are you Grace? Like, do, does it does it get overwhelming with being told all of these these stories? Even just to report on them from a distance, it can it can be a lot. That, that you can carry a lot of kind of or hear and process a lot of people's kind of pain. Um, how are you? 
<laughs> I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit tired. It's been yeah. a busy few months. Um, but look, as, as, uh, as difficult as it is at times, you know, to, to hear these stories, um, a lot of them are horrific. Um, you know, it's, it's a wholly regenerative pursuit, creating change and working in this space because it's a great privilege when somebody chooses you to be the person that they open up to. Um, and I think that we have to remind each other of that, um, you know, that it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of strength to come forward. And so, um, you know, although I don't have a counselling background, I'm not a therapist, um, you know, I implicitly offer my support and love um, and am encouraging people to, to seek out the right resources um, and support services and, uh, you know, just take things one step at a time. That's all we can do on this. And Kate, in, in your book, um, you, you tell a lot of the stories that we haven't heard before about some of the kind of sexualisation of women in politics and the, the demeaning and the personalising of things and, and making women seem um, as though they're not a natural fit in a position of power. So we're also seeing the telling of stories about particularly parliament, particularly politics. What do you see as going on there and do you think this is going to have a tangible impact when it comes to the lives of the women that operate in those spheres and beyond? I think that this movement will absolutely lead to real and meaningful change and I want to take the opportunity to thank Grace. Um, how incredibly lucky are we as a nation to have her um, and her courage and the leadership that she's shown. I think that, I mean, Grace has been talking about obviously um, the most brutal end of the spectrum when it comes to the disrespect of women, rape and sexual assault. I guess um, I'm focused, I was focused in the book on issues that were happening in the parliament and one of the motivations for that is because I thought if there is this general culture of kind of low level disrespect in the organisation that is in charge of taking action, of funding programs, of making sure that support services have what they need um, to roll out and support the community as they're needed, then that is a very big problem in itself. So I think what we're seeing at the moment is, you know, you talk about the increase in the number of people calling um, sexual assault support services. But I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Like there are women across Australia who are disclosing to their husbands, to their fathers, mm -hmm. to um, people for the first time. And the other part of this that's really significant is it means that there are a whole lot of men who in the last couple of months have heard stories they've never heard before and perspectives they've never heard before. And I think it's changing attitudes. I think it's incredibly powerful. I think Brittany Higgins, Grace Tame, um, are just truly remarkable women and we owe it to them for standing up and telling their story is to make sure that meaningful real change comes as a result. Mm. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, one of the things that struck me when we've had a conversation about do people, uh, you know, what if this happened to a daughter or what if your son was accused of something, it really did strike me at the time that a lot of fathers wouldn't know if something had happened to their daughters because they probably might not have spoken to them about it, you know. That, 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 there's been a lot of, of, of women telling family members over the last couple of months, which I think has been hugely significant. Well, and the other part of that is um, people are learning that people's reactions um, to, to trauma are really complex and complicated. That, um, you know, this is not a simple, yes. you tell someone, you report it to the police, you move on with your life. People deal with this in different ways and some of those ways are quite confusing to people. So the, the greater awareness we have about that, then I think the more comfort people will have mm -hmm. in telling their truths. Right. Um, Nafe, this is something that is, that just obviously we've seen um, marches across Capitol streets through regional areas. Um, it dominated the news cycle for a good long period. It slipped off the front pages now. We're obviously seeing the work that Grace is still doing, the momentum, these conversations. Now, if you were uh, an advisor, if the, this women's movement, this enough is enough, came to you as a client and said, what would you advise us n to do now? We want to see real change. What would you be saying? 
Um, my first bit of advice to them is figure out what it is you actually want. Actually be clear on your objectives and be clear on the outcome that you want. Second is talk to the key players who will actually make the decision, not just the target audience. There's a lot of momentum of support and often happens when you have um, mass movements, but because they're directionless mm. in terms of what the actual ask is, they don't achieve and people get disappointed by the effort, emotional effort they've put into the cause. Um, third one is be honest with yourselves around um, the situation you are in and what power you potentially have. Okay, don't presume everybody's on your side. We saw that happen 10 years ago with the environmental movement. Everyone presumed, lost a lot of momentum because it was unclear in its direction. Mm. You said that was part <coughs> of the problem, is that people presuming or just taking it for granted that there will be inevitable progress. It was inevitable. Progress. Yeah, it was right. inevitable. Yep. I mean, you, you see it now with the Black Lives Matter. Everyone would have said to you six, nine months ago, something change was inevitable and they're still struggling because people actually don't know what the change is. Right. So what is the change you are seeking? You have to get agreement amongst those people who have taken on a leadership role mm. in the movement. Otherwise, you're not going to get there. Mm. I mean, it's a classic, it's very doable. It takes a long time and you, we know this. I mean, 100 years ago, Labor movement formed the Labor Party. 50, 60 years ago, the regional issues and rural issues formed the country and the National Party. 30, 40 years ago, environmental issues formed the Greens Party. Maybe it's time for a women's party. Hmm. Uh, Grace, I could see that you were nodding at, uh, uh, away um, when uh, Faye was talking about the need to have kind of tangible goals. You've outlined very tangible goals about the need for national uniform national laws on consent. But I want to put yep. to you the question that I was... Um, that, I, that I put to Faye, which is we know it's, this isn't dominating the media currently, other things will come up and preoccupy journalists, but the, the, the movement rolls on in many ways. Can you tell us about some of the work that you're doing and what you're saying? Oh, yes. Well, look, media coverage, sustained media coverage is not necessarily the, the only um, hallmark of success. Um, as activists and advocates uh, the world over know, you know, a lot of work is 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 done in 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 silence, um, and uh, you know I've I've got a lot of work ahead of me. I'm meeting with relevant um, policy and decision makers um, at the state level um, and hopefully at the federal level as well. Although admittedly I'm disappointed with federal leadership on this issue, um, the consent campaigns that have. Uh, come out the videos oh, there. We're about um, to get to that actually. Yeah, so we'll very hop. problematic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, well why don't we why don't we come up to that in a moment. Actually before before we do, Grace, can you can you tell us what it is that you want about uniform con consent laws? People who haven't heard you articulate that before, what do we need to be looking at nationally? It's a very specific so, goal. Mm. Yeah, so I do have a really specific um, quite simple goal here, I think, well maybe not simple in in, in actually um, implementing it because it will involve um, getting the eight states to agree um, and implement legislation. Um, but so currently we have uh, eight different definitions of consent across the nation in the different jurisdictions. Um, and it's not, no, it's not necessarily that one is better than the other, it's the fact that we have eight of them which undermines our ability to understand the concept and take it seriously and consent is a concept that is absolute and it's very complex. Um, so I think uh, having a, a national um, standardised approach to that is a great place to start because when we when we have legislative change like that, that's when you see cultural change mm -hmm. and that's when you can see um, education uh, improve accordingly. All right, let's uh, talk about one educational attempt because in recent months we've, we've also been grappling with demands for better consent education and we've been talking about that on this show. To help with this, the government has produced some new educational material to guide conversations about respectful relationship. But there is one video that's been circulating today that hasn't quite landed, to put it mildly. It's been labelled confusing and condescending. What do you think? To cross into the action zone, both people must agree. Do you want to try my milkshake? Yes, I do. Is it better than yours? You know I think I prefer mine. But what happens when one person takes action without an agreement? You do, huh? Well, drink it. This is what we call moving the line. When a person imposes their will on you, 
It's as if they were moving the yes line over the maybe zone or the end zone, ignoring your rich inner world and violating your individual freedoms and rights. Kate Ellis, this is so weird to me. Can you decipher this ad? No. No, I can't. I, um, you know, I watched this today and if it wasn't on such an important issue, it would be amusing because it is so ridiculous. But it actually just infuriated me because it seems like this is yet another example of where people are more concerned about upsetting those who find it uncomfortable to have real conversations then they're concerned about the people who will suffer serious consequences if we don't have those real conversations. Um, like I had a, I wasn't gonna share this on national television, but earlier today, my three and my five year old boys decided it would be really funny if they kept licking me. And I sat them down and I had a more direct conversation about consent, about respecting other people's wishes and about, um, you know, being in charge of our own bodies with a three-year-old than the federal government has put out in this ad, which is for teenagers. Um, I can't explain it. I think it's ridiculous and I think somebody needs to own, own up to that. Um, let's just have a real conversation. If we want to make change, then people need to understand what we're talking about. And I have less idea about consent after watching that video than I did have before it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I showed it to my teenager who was like, the, it was it's six minutes long. She does not have that long an attention span for starters. After about 30 seconds, she's like, can we move along? And she's also very, very confused by it. Uh, Grace, what, what is it? Is there something about tiptoeing about what we actually want to talk about by using a milkshake as a proxy that's a bit odd? Oh, this video is so problematic in so many ways. Um, I think it's just insulting to the intelligence of, of, of everyone, um, you know, not just um, a, not just adults, to children as well. Like Kate was saying, you know, th three-year-olds and five-year-olds, I think their intelligence would be insulted by this. Um, it also minimises the experience of, of rape trauma. It fails to really address um, the the you know, nuances of this complex issue of consent. Um, also very concerning is the fact that the government claimed to um, collaborate or, or have, um, uh, or consult, sorry, our watch, the peak body um, in the primary prevention of sexual abuse space um, on this. And our watch have come out and said that they, they didn't. Um, so that's very concerning uh, in of itself. But I think that this is just, it's indicative of, of poor leadership, of, of poor, a poor understanding of, of how serious this issue is. Mm. Craig, you've got teenagers. Does that get, make you any closer to kind of fathoming consent when it comes to milkshakes? Um, I didn't understand it. And, and, <laughs> and in the age of TikTok, I reckon one minute's the maximum anybody's got an attention span for. So, look, you know, I don't want to be bashing people about these ads, but I think, you know, it really is... A, a, um, a, 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 an ad that didn't didn't make any sense to me at all, and I agree that we need to have much more direct conversations. But it's almost like um, you know we're, we're skipping this whole um, broader conversation with the whole community. All of our children are about fully respectful relationships of each other, uh, and consent is one part of that. And I, I almost feel like I, I don't even need to have a specific conversation about consent with my son. It's more about the broader relationships. And I can't imagine him not respecting somebody who said no. We've always had in our family a, you know, a stop I don't like it type you know, arrangement. Uh, and that's been respected. So I, I, I really don't know where that ad was targeted. Um, but but uh, 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 the recent stories and allegations, is that sparking different conversations around the people that, that you know? In terms well, of... well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, I think that, 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 that Grace and, and, and all of the stories that have come out um, in, in recent times have really brought this to the, to the forefront. And I think the comments that were made earlier about what is next, I think, is really important because now that there's been this, this, this galvanised um, sort of uh, movement, we now need to say, well, what do we want next? What is the next thing? And certainly education is a really important part of that. You know, the, the, the comment that Grace made about not having unified consent rules around the country just is unfathomable. We have unified 
criminal codes, we have unified rules about all sorts of things. Mm. How is it that in different states we have different rules about consent? So obviously there's, there's that part of it, mm. but then there's a broader discussion just about, about respectful relationships with each other and, and surely that can start in the parliament as well. Mm. Mm. Um, you've brought up a teenager as well, Faye. Yes, I have. It's it, fabulous. Doesn't this show, though, a real gap between what they're exposed to, how they talk to each other, what they're dealing with, and how we think we might be able to help with those situations? It's, it's, that's a huge gap there. They're way more honest in their communication than we are. Right. And it's about comfort levels. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the people who put this together didn't actually want to produce information that would address the issue. They wanted to stay within their comfort levels. So satisfy, avoid stigma and shame, avoid talking about uncomfortable issues, avoid um, anything that directly dealt with the situation. And as a result, they ended up with this completely confusing mishmash, which is a module in a bigger piece of work, which makes you question that bigger piece of work. Because it's clearly, it's, it's, well, it's unclear. What's its purpose? Is this designed to spark a conversation or is it just designed to make the issue go away? Yeah, I think I think it's action for the sake of being seen to do something. Mm. Um, yep, I think it's that simple. It's just, it's just so it, it is just it's the incongruity. So we see the testimony of Grace, and we see Brittany Higgins speaking. It's 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 raw. It's powerful. It's what's actually going on. It's what people mm. are actually dealing with. And then this weird happy days kind of sitting in a soda bar situation. I, I may be super cynical, but I'd love to know when this video was commissioned. Ah, uh, mm. OK. Well, we'll just put that out there and hopefully someone will tell us by the end of the show. I may regret saying that. <laughs> all right. Now, I want to talk about the role that social media plays in all this because we know that platforms like Instagram, TikTok and Facebook help us stay connected, entertain us, distract us. They're also having an impact on the mental health of people, particularly children and young people. For 27-year-old Patrick Boyle, it took a cycling injury for him to face up to the impact social media was having on him. Yes, I went through my entire teenage life assuming that everyone hated their bodies and obsessed over them and obsessed over eating and dieting. Instagram really was a thing for me that um, sent everything downhill even further because in times when you wouldn't be thinking about your body or about diet, uh, suddenly you open your phone and you're mindlessly scrolling through this and I mean, for someone with an eating disorder, you always have that chugging along in the back of your brain. Patrick was talking to Triple J's Hack and they've now launched an investigation calling for young Australians to tell them how social media has affected their body image. Meghna Bali is a reporter from Triple J's Hack working on this story. Welcome to the drum. Yeah, hi there. Hey, what a great idea for an investigation to actually try to pull together, you know, a anecdotal evidence on what is actually going on. Tell us what you're hoping to uncover. Yeah, look, Patrick's story has actually kicked off a year-long crowdsourced investigation that we hope, you know, we've launched today. And the whole idea basically is to go into the relationship between social media and body image. Now, we know that, you know, continued exposure to social media, to places like Instagram and TikTok and Tumblr, uh, really sort of cause a fraught relationship between young people and their bodies. And we know this because our listeners have actually told us that. Um, you know, and because of the pandemic, uh, you know, we've got sort of, we've been at home for about a year now, you know, 13, 14 months, and all young people have had to do is, you know, learn remotely and they've had access to their phones. Uh, and, you know, we've had people, you know, talk to us about how that makes them unhappy with their their bodies. Mm. Now you've also used a, a bloke as your um, your case study with this. Is that is that a deliberate thing? Because we always talk about women and eating disorders, which actually can render the, the men who are dealing with this kind of invisible or not understood. Yeah, you know, we launched the investigation this morning. We've gotten hundreds of responses and a lot of them are guys. Wow. And you're right, you know, sometimes when we think about social media and, you know, exposure to, like, these ideal, you know, body stereotypes, we often think about models, women, you know, the Kardashians, we're talking about Gigi Hadid, you know, these are the people that often come up. But the reality is that guys are exposed to quite similar things as well. You know, they're exposed to diet trends, they're exposed to, you know, 
you know, pictures of big muscly guys, you know, these sorts of, you know, fitness challenges, they're just as susceptible. And, you know, like Patrick says, you know, he's struggled with this throughout his teenage years. And it's only now, you know, through actively trying to unlearn those behaviours mm -hmm. and unlearn what he's seeing on social media. You know, now he's at the stage where he's, you know, calling himself a chubby king. But, you know, there's, there's millions of kids out there in Australia that, you know, aren't, you know, thinking about social media in that way. Mm. Now, I know it's not just early days, but it's just been today. But in terms of all these responses that you've had so far, what have, what have you noticed? Yeah, look, already off the bat, what's emerging is that social media and body image are really intimately connected. You know, we're hearing stories about people that are excessively exercising, people with lived experience of disordered eating, who say that in this pandemic, and because they've been on social media so much, uh, their eating disorders have gotten worse. We're hearing that, you know, fitness tracking apps are really taking off. Um, and, you know, this is sort of a... A, a disordered eating pattern that isn't talked about as much as, say, anorexia or bulimia, uh, but it is sort of quite, you know, emerging uh, now as well. The other thing we're actually hearing, which is quite interesting, is that people, you know, young people are starting to game the algorithm. So what they've realised is the more they engage with these kinds of posts, the more they're offered up. Uh, so what they've done is now they're starting to unfollow, you know, things that are making them feel unhappy and they're following more body positivity pages mm. and they're seeing that that's actually impacting their mental health health for the better. Mm, that can be a double-edged sword in there. I just want to bring Grace Tame in here. Grace, you've spoken about a, a long-standing struggle with um, anorexia and what are your observations from your own experience about what social media can, can mean? Oh, look, um, my eating disorder predated the existence of, of Instagram and, and TikTok and, and those sorts of things. Um, but I, I personally think that... Um, we use social media too much, and that's that's the problem. It's 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 not real, you know. It's it's snapshots of of reality, and it's a very surface um, experience. Um, and you've got people who are um, very influential on that platform who are using uh, face alteration apps, um, and and so you've got young girls and boys um, seeing these images and, and, and trying to um, or comparing themselves and, um, to these just completely unrealistic beauty standards and that's, it's, it's incredibly damaging and also you sort of said it before when you, when you prefaced this whole discussion, um, social media is a distraction, you know, it, it's, it's a form of disconnection really from meaningful values. Yeah, what about those people who go to plastic surgeons and say, I want to look like the way my filter oh. makes me look because I don't want to oh. even look at my own face anymore. Like, like, when you think you're only worth posting when you've been through several layers of adjustment, like, where does that leave us with, with, with self-loathing? That's a big sigh from you, Faye. Mm. I mean, we've danced around it. Part of this is that social media amplifies social problems that we've always had. I mean, the first accounts of people who are unhappy with their body image are like 700 years ago. Mm. So is as human really? beings... Is that all? Yeah. Were they happy before 700 well, years ago? Well, we don't ago, have a they? recount of it. But OK. St Catherine of Siena basically had what we would call it... Um, a, a problem with an eating disorder. Right. Her body image was one of the reasons that she discovered Christ. Hmm. So um, the... It, and that's been going on. And social media has amplified like it does almost everything the worst and the best in our society. And there's no quick fix, but I suggest what people have been talking about, the fix lies in less screen time. You know, you can't moderate the websites, you can't control the volume of the traffic. There is so much content being pushed out every second of every day. You, it's, it's, the analogy I've used before on this is, you can't drain the pool, you have to teach people to swim. And one of the techniques is less screen time. But what if you also want to teach them how to swim online? Like, how do you navigate that space if you're going to be on it, Kate? Well, I think what we need to recognise is that this generation is actually going through something that none of us have gone mm. through previously. Mm. Um, that, that we know that they are exposed to more images in their life mm. um, than we ever have been before. And they are digitally altered 
they are unrealistic and they are constant. And it's not just social media, it's all over the internet, it's all over advertising. Um, it, is, it is something that, I know when I was the youth minister, we had a focus on body image campaigns because of the photoshopping that magazines could use back then. Well, this is, people can do their own photoshopping in their own bedroom, in their own, on their beach, wherever they are, everybody has access to this technology. So I think that this um, survey and this work is really, really important. One, so that we can learn how big this issue is, but two, so we can actually raise awareness about, I don't think that it's realistic for us to say, um, put away your phones, get off the screens. But what we can do is try and raise awareness about how unrealistic the images that people are aspiring to replicate are. I think that's how we build resilience um, mm -hmm. in young people so that they, they recognise that this is very unrealistic um, and it's not real life. And, you know, maybe we could all turn the filters off a bit as well. Does that, make do. you, does that make you want to tear your hair out a bit, that you put all this time and effort into, like, let's not allow people to digitally alter images, and now people have taken it up them, themselves in such vast, like, vast amounts? It's like when I look back, you know that whole myth of the bra burning, people don't know whether it actually happened at that Miss America in the late 1960s, but there was a big bin and they threw things into it. They threw in a bra and they threw in, like, eyelash curlers and something else, like, I don't know, like, eyeshadow and they were like, let's just set the whole thing, you know, on fire or we just don't need it anymore. Like, compare that now to what an influencer might contain in like a makeup drawer and that is absolutely nothing. Well, it is, but the other thing is that, you know, that, those kind of filters and things can be fun or even if it's, you know, making yourself look like an angel or a puppy dog or whatever it might be. I think that that's fine if we're also educating people that um, that this is that is not real life mm. and that there is a difference and we celebrate real life bodies and um, and that we recognise that this is increasingly becoming an issue for young men. Craig, well, I, th I agree with most people here, but I do think moderation is is one of the, the secrets. You know, the more time you spend online looking at these images, images the more damaging I think it is. And look, my, my 19 year old daughter says, I know they're not real, it's just entertainment for me and I just turn it off when I've just had enough of it and that's it. I think having, yeah. having a capacity, a resilience, having a capacity to suspend disbelief, we know maths is not real but it's entertainment, you turn it off. You oh, know, back to maths again. Yeah, math, yeah back to yeah. maths again, <laughs> last night was the end. Uh, and, and so, at first sight, yes. So, but, but you know, just this whole idea that you can suspend disbelief for a moment, you can enjoy it for a moment and, and then go back to your normal life. I, I agree with Kate, you know, it is a bit of fun sometimes. You know, having all of these different filters and playing around mm. with it, it is good fun. Mm. Uh, but but you know, using it for a tool for you know for a good, I think is is much better. Limiting your time on it certainly is is important. Megna, what, what, I want to have your reflections on all these potential solutions that are suggested because from what I, I watch in, in young women and teenagers and the way they consume this stuff, it's kind of with the knowledge that it's dumb and with the knowledge that it's altered and that it can be addictive but it's sometimes a bit of hate watching, sometimes a bit of I'm going to like just bring in a bit of self-loathing by by following people who look great in bikinis. It's kind of a complicated space, right? Like, how do, how do we actually think about making it better? Yeah, look, I think, well, look, our listeners are never shy from sort of inundating our socials, uh, you know, with their opinions of it. I think the approach of, like, just don't look at it is not going to ever work. I think with young people, it will probably have the opposite effect of it, I think. But I really like this idea of, like, you know, informing people and being educated about what you're seeing. You know, there was this really interesting response from a young woman today, and she was talking about how, you know, she, you know, sort of 18 to 24 year old, and she was talking about how, you know, she's part of a generation that's aware that magazines are photoshopped. <laughs> but often, you know, that same, you know, knowledge isn't extended to social media. You sort of know there are filters, but you don't expect filters from, say, friends, mates, family members, you know, but, but people still are altering and, you know, filtering what they're posting. And you might not think that they are, but you're constantly being exposed to these things. So I sort of agree with the, you know, with the view that the more educated you are and the more transparent people are, you know, with what they're looking at and whether they're filtering things, uh, you know, that sort of 
uh, you know, indicates what's real and what's fake. But I think the idea that people should stop using it uh, is, you know, I don't know how that's going to fly with young people, to be honest. Yeah, because but... I, I noticed in the piece today, um, I think it was Mia Finlay, a butterfly ambassador, said social media platforms should do more to weed out potentially harmful content. But where would you start? Mm. Well that's, well, that's it, right? I think there are sort of direct, like there's places like TikTok and Instagram, you know, there, are, there used to be this thing a few years ago called, um, there was a hashtag called Pro Anna. And so you, right. what you'd see is you'd see sort of, uh, you know, these hashtags filtered with um, content that was pro particular eating disorders. And, the, you know, once that sort of came to light, social media organisations have been really quick to remove material and right. hashtags like that and actually replace them with, uh, you know, numbers to the Butterfly Foundation right. um, and so you know, places like Inside done. Out. Yeah, awesome research. I really keep us posted on how you go with it. If you've been affected by anything we've been discussing on the program called Lifeline on 13 11 14 or 1 800 Respect. And I want to thank our panel. That's all we have time for, of course. Faye Akendoyani, Craig Chong, Craig Ellis Grace Tame, and I guess Meghna Bali. Hope you have a great night. I'm going to see you. I don't think adults really care how important this earth is. Climate change isn't coming, it's here. Climate emergency. You interfere with Mother Nature, this is what you get. We need to have a clear reality check. If the government won't help us, we will sink. We were instructed, don't call it climate change. What's been the cost in the making of your fortune? A 7.30 special series. If this happened, we'll be climate change refugees in our own country. Tonight, ABC TV will stream it on iview. The first instinct of the authorities is always to cover up. China and the pandemic. I have no doubt the scientists and doctors on the front lines knew exactly what they were dealing with. What they knew.